Hi, this is National Master Dan Heisman, and we're here with another video to help you improve your chess game. This is going to be more like a podcast, so if you're looking for action on the board, I would say of my other 314 videos, probably 300 of them have plenty more board action than this one. So we're going to talk in this one about knowing the rules of the game. Okay, when I go to tournaments and clubs, it seems like almost every tournament I go to, there's one, two, three, four games that are affected because people don't know the rules, don't follow the rules. And no matter how many times we make announcements, please, you know, get the tournament director, follow the rules. People don't do it. They take the law in their own hands and crazy things happen. So that's one of the reasons for this video. Now, another reason for this video is I'm trying to match as many of the key novice nooks that I wrote in video form, which is one reason why I, this one was put off so long, is this is really more of a, a written kind of thing. That's why it's a podcast rather than a video. But uh, I'm trying to cover all the main ideas. And one of my big novice nooks was know the rules. So we're going to do that right now. We're going to talk about knowing the rules. Okay, so let's give an example of what happened at the last tournament. Uh, two of the players were playing. Uh, White was fairly inexperienced and she set up the pieces wrong. She set up her king and her queen wrong. They were reversed. So they started playing the game and after they played a couple moves, my uh, friend who was playing black noticed that White had set up the pieces wrong. So what White did was just reach over the board and switch the king and the queen and then continue the game. That is completely illegal for a couple of reasons. One, you're not allowed, only the tournament director could do something like that. And number two is that's not the rule. The rule is if you start a game with the pieces set up wrong and you catch it within the first 10 moves, then of course you get the tournament director. The tournament director will reset all the pieces up correctly for the start of the game, and you will start the game over, but the clocks will not be reset. The reason is, if you took 20 minutes to play the first seven moves, and then you realize the king and the queen were reversed, if you reset the clocks, then everybody else would have to wait 20 minutes for the next round to start, because your game would be 20 minutes late. So the rule says, you start if, the, if you catch the illegal setup, within the first 10 moves, you restart the game, the moves of the game, but you don't restart the clocks. But again, most players aren't going to know that. They have to get the tournament director. But they didn't, and they just continued the game illegally, basically. If the game goes more than 10 moves, and the game was set up originally wrong, and then you catch it, then it's too late. The game will just continue as normal with no adjustment at all. You just keep playing with the pieces where they are. So that's the rule. But again, you're not supposed to know it. So that leads to the most important rule in all of chess, which is don't take the law into your own hands. Don't guess at the rules. Even if you know the rules, don't apply the rules yourself. When something happens in your game, stop the clock, get the tournament director. Normally, you want to stop the clock only when it's your turn. So if your opponent's thinking, you can go get the tournament director and he could stop your opponent's clock. But you shouldn't stop your the clock when your opponent is thinking, except under extraordinary circumstances but you can get the tournament director no matter whose clock is is running so if your opponent's clock's running you can go get the tournament director and explain what happened if your clock is running you should stop your clock get the tournament director bring them over to your table explain what's going on and make sure that uh, everything is okay that way by the way that's also one of the reasons why over the board you're required to keep score because if there's a question about the rules with regard to, the, to what's happening with the score, the tournament director will look at both players' score sheets to see what it says and try to determine what really happened. If one player is keeping score and the other player isn't, let's say they don't know how to keep score, and there's a dispute, and the player who's keeping score, his side of the dispute is upheld by his score, and the other player says that's not what happened, but they're not keeping score, then unfortunately the rule says that the tournament director should decide everything else being equal on the side of the player who has the proof of the score sheet and not the player who's just saying verbally what happened when they have no proof. 
So score sheets act as a kind of proof. Okay, so let's let's talk about it. So you're going to get the tournament director no matter what. Um, what's the most common misuse of the rules? The most common misuse of the rules are illegal moves. A lot of people don't understand the difference between touch move and illegal move. A touch move, of course, if someone touches, let's say you touch a piece that's pinned to your king and can't move, is that an illegal move? No, it would only be illegal if you actually moved it to a different square and then you hit the clock. If you just touch the piece, that's not an illegal move because you haven't actually made a move and hit the clock. Your move is not completed until you hit the clock, so you can't make illegal moves until you hit the clock. On the other hand, touch move says you either touch a piece, you have to move it. If you take your hand off a piece, you have to leave it there. If you touch your opponent's piece first and you could capture it, then you have to capture that piece. Touch move also requires that the piece you touch has to be deliberate. Let's say you reach out to move your bishop and you accidentally knock over your king with your elbow and your opponent says, touch move, you have to move your king. Well, no, you don't, because it wasn't purposeful. It was an accident. So you didn't purposely grab your king and then go, oh, whoops. Now, again, you need to get the tournament director because, again, people don't know the rules. We're always seeing people call the rules. In some situations, when your opponent makes an illegal move, you will get two minutes added to your clock. But again, you can't do that. Only the tournament director can do that. So again, whenever something strange is happening in your game, no matter what it is, get the tournament director. This also leads to an interesting point that over the board chess is a lot more rules oriented than online chess. In online chess, a lot of things like draw offers and things like that are all done through button pushes and the rules are programmed into the computer so that it's kind of hard not to follow the rule. If you try to make an illegal draw offer online, it just won't allow you to do it. While in a tournament, nothing's stopping you. So it's more important to understand about getting the tournament director and such when you're playing at clubs and tournaments than it is when you're playing online. With online, there's still a bunch of rules. You know, for instance, you should report your opponent to the server. Let's say you're playing a slow game and your opponent's playing quickly and he has 42 minutes left and he blunders his queen and instead of resigning, he just lets his clock run for 42 minutes. Well, okay, I know when they used to do that on the Internet Chess Club, the Internet Chess Club told me, please tell your students to have them report their opponents when they do that because we want to find out when people are doing that so we can warn them not to do it again and if they keep doing it, we, we have a clause in the uh, sign-up sheet for the Internet Chess Club that if you keep doing things against our rules of our of the club, then we can withdraw your, uh, we can kick you off the server and not return your money. So it, it, that's one of the benefits of playing in a, in a paid server is they can tell people, if you don't do things, we're going to withdraw your privileges. And uh, if you're playing at some place where everything's free all the time, then it's more like the Wild West. You know, a lot of things, people can get away with a lot of things because there's, there's nothing that they can do about them. Okay, uh, another big rule that we should talk about is bothering the opponent. People say to me specific things like, is my opponent allowed to do X or allowed to do Y? And there's no way the rule book could list every possible thing someone could do. So the rule book is actually very general. The rule book simply states you're not allowed to purposely bother your opponent. So if your opponent is doing something, tapping on the table or, you know, moving their foot around and hitting things or they're, you know, flapping their arms or whatever things that they're doing that, that's annoying you, then again, you could stop your clock, get the tournament director, tell the tournament director what they're doing, and the tournament director has to decide if your complaint is reasonable. Like, for instance, suppose your opponent's just breathing normally and you decide you don't like him breathing normally and you go to the tournament director and say, my opponent is breathing normally, but that bothers me. I want you to tell him to stop. Well, the tournament director is going to decide that that's not reasonable and he's not going to ask your opponent to stop. You're, you could certainly ask the tournament director such a crazy thing, but uh, he's not going to, he doesn't have to uphold it just because you ask. Now, on the other hand, spectators in, in USCF tournaments, U.S. Chess Federation tournaments, have no rights that way. So if, it, if someone is watching your game, even if they're, you know, standing five feet away and they're being perfectly silent and everything, 
and that bothers you, you have the right to go up to the tournament director and say, could you please tell this person not to watch my game, send them at least, you know, 20 feet away or whatever. The tournament director will not ask whether that what that person is doing. The tournament director will not um, try to decide if your request is reasonable. They will simply ask the spectator to move far enough away from your game that you can't reasonably complain about it. In that sense, spectators have no rights. So you have the right as a player to basically eject a spectator from the area where you're playing. So again, know the rules, know the rules. All right, let's talk about offering and accepting draws. If you're playing online again, whatever the server allows you to do, if there's a button that says hit the button to offer a draw, then if you can hit, if the button allows you to hit the button, then you're offering a draw. But over the board, it's different. Over the board, there's only one legal way to offer a draw. And that is you make your move to determine your move, but you do not hit the clock to complete the move. You determine your move, you let go of the piece, you then offer a draw to your opponent, and then you hit the clock and let them decide on their time, in which case they have three possible things they can do. They can say yes and the game is over and it's a draw. They can say no and the game will continue and it's not a draw. Or they can say nothing and make the move, which is a de facto way of saying no I don't want the draw and all three of those are perfectly legal. At our club a couple years ago someone complained they offered a draw and their opponent did not say yes or no they just made a move and they said that was not polite they think I should you know admonish them and tell them it's a friendly club and when someone offers a draw they should say something and I said to them I can't do that your opponent followed the rules of the game as perfectly written I can't admonish them for doing something the rules say is perfectly legal. And they said, well, it may be legal, but it's not very nice. They shouldn't do it. It's a, it we're a polite club, and it's rude to do that. And I said, I'm sorry, but I have to disagree. We're going to have to agree to disagree because as a tournament director, if they perfectly follow the rules and don't do anything wrong in any way, I can't consider that rude. They're just following what the rule book allows them to do, and I don't think that's rude. You're certainly allowed your opinion, but... I don't think that's so. Now what comes up very often is what happens if your opponent offers an illegal draw? Suppose he's sitting there thinking and all of a sudden he looks up to you and says, would you like a draw? What should you do? Well, except in one case, the answer is you should say to them, please make a move and I will consider it. Why do you do that? Well, because they're really not allowed to offer you the draw illegally like they did and you have the right to see their move before you decide on the draw. If they say to you, no, I'm sorry, if I make the move, I'm going to withdraw my draw offer, you should stop the clock, get the tournament director, and say, excuse me, Mr. Tournament Director, my opponent has offered me a draw on their time. I asked them to make a move. They said they were going to withdraw the draw offer. The tournament director will go over and, and make sure that that's actually what happened. If it is what happened, then they will tell your opponent, I'm sorry, but you made a draw offer on your time. That's illegal, but the, the rule is that that draw offer has to stand until your opponent's, after you make the move on your opponent's move, and at that point they can decide. The reason you want to do that, besides the fact that it's the rule, is suppose they make a move, suppose they have, it's a drawn position, but they make a terrible blunder, and now you're winning. Well, then of course that you want to see that blunder so you know not to take the draw. On the other hand, suppose they're winning and they offer you a draw, and then they make a move that makes it even more obvious to you that they're winning. Well, then you want to see that so that you can see, oh, thanks for offering me a draw, and then you can accept the draw. There's only one time you wouldn't do that. Can you think of what it is? You can always pause the video if you want. The answer is, suppose your opponent has mate and one, and he offers you a draw. Then it would be silly to say, please make your move, and I'll determine it. I'll, de I'll make my decision because... At that point, they could checkmate you, and then the game would be over, and the draw would no longer be on the table because the game would be over. So if you see they have mate and one, and they offer you a draw, then I would accept the illegal draw offer and take your draw and go home. Uh, if you make the move, you run the risk of losing. But if there's no mate and one, then you have absolutely no downside risk from saying, please make your move. Okay, let's see here. Claims for threefold repetition of position. This is a very interesting claim. In order to make a claim for a draw like this, 
you have to have it be your move. But if you wait till after you repeat the position for the third time and hit the clock, it's not your move anymore. So this, the correct way to offer a draw is, sorry, to claim a draw on threefold repetition when you're playing over the board is you make the move that, sorry, you write the move on your score sheet that would create the third time of the move position occurring. It's not, by the way, it's not threefold repetition of moves. It's threefold repetition of position. And it does not have to be on consecutive moves. It could be the same position with the same person to move on move 17, 59, and 123. That's a draw. So threefold repetition of position. What you do is you write down the move on your score sheet that you think will create the threefold repetition of position. You then stop the clock, tell your opponent, I have written down whatever the move is, queen to b3. That will repeat the position for the third time. I'm going to claim a draw. Your opponent then has two choices. Your opponent can say, you're right. I agree to a draw. Shake your hand. Off you go. Or your opponent can say, no, I don't think that is. I don't think it's the exact same position with the same person to move three times, and I don't want the draw. So let's get the tournament director. And then at that point, you get the tournament director. He'll look at both score sheets and try to determine if the same position has occurred three times once you make that move with, with the move that you wrote on your score sheet. But if you actually make the move on the board and hit the clock, then you can't claim the, anything until the next move. So that would be too late. So you don't want to complete your move when you're claiming the draw by threefold repetition. You just want to write it on your score sheet, stop the clock, claim it to your opponent. If your opponent says yes, it doesn't even matter if you're right or not. If they say yes, if I'm, a, I'm agreeing to a draw, then it's an agreed draw. By the way, that's one of the rules that you should know, which is if you claim a draw, it's also the same thing as an offer of a draw. So if you claim a draw and your opponent says, don't even get the tournament director, I'm happy with the draw, then you're done. You don't need the tournament director to, to work to uh, decide whether your draw claim was legitimate or not. Okay, keeping score. The U.S. Chess Federation requires that when you're playing over the board, you must keep score move after move until at least one person has less than five minutes left on their clock. So if you have eight minutes left and your opponent gets down to five minutes left, you're both of you are allowed to stop keeping score. But what I tell my students is very often, if your opponent gets to less than five minutes and you have more than five minutes, it's a gigantic, just because you're allowed to stop keeping score, it's actually a gigantic mistake because inexperienced players who stop keeping score have a tendency to play too fast. And if you have a good position and you're not dead lost, you don't want to start playing too fast because you could start making mistakes. So if you have like, I don't know, let's instead of eight minutes, let's say you have 25 minutes left and your opponent has five and the game's still competitive. You're not dead lost. Maybe it's kind of equal. Maybe you're better. And your opponent starts, stops keeping score and starts playing fast. If you match him and do that too, that's a monstrous mistake. You should never, ever, ever do that. I've seen so many people do that and throw games away. It's such a silly beginner thing to do. You should continue to keep score, continue to play slow. Don't play fast just because your opponent's in time trouble unless you're dead lost. If you're dead lost, whole different story. The only reason you're playing on is and not resigning is because your opponent's clock is low. Then you don't want him to think on your time. But if you're not dead lost and you have lots of time, and you do not want to play fast on your opponent's uh, time scramble. It's not a good idea when your opponent is in time pressure to play fast unless you're dead lost. Okay, so if either side gets the five minutes left, you may stop keeping score. If you get the less than five minutes left, then you should almost undoubtedly stop keeping score unless you're in a situation like, let's say it's 40 moves in two hours and you get to move 37 and you have five minutes left to make three moves and you want to prove you made the three moves and you're only making three moves. It's not sudden death. Well, then you should keep continue to keep score and write your 38th, 39th, and 40th moves down. If you're playing 40 and 2 and you have to make 20 moves in one minute and you need to know when you made move 40 and you can't write them down because you don't have time and you have only a minute left, the, the rules suggest that you check off the moves so that you know how many moves have been played so that when you get to move 40, then you know you can slow down and then you get, get the extra time. You have to be careful about letting the clock do that for you because sometimes clock, digital clocks that are set that way are hit wrong like at the start of the game maybe black didn't start white's clock and the move counter is wrong or something. 
So you want to check off the moves and make sure that you've got the right number of moves in before your flag falls. All right, what's the statute of limitations for a lot of rules? For most rules, the statute of limitations is during that move. So if your opponent makes an illegal move, either you get the tournament director right then, or you forfeit your right to get the tournament director and claim illegal move. So if he makes an illegal move, and you see it, and you go, I'm going to let it ride, and then three moves later, you blunder, and then you say, well, he made an illegal move three moves ago. I'm going to go get the tournament director and go back to that move. That you can't do. You've already passed the statute of limitations. The statute of limitations for a lot of things is that move. Now, there's one clear rule where the statute of limitations extends all the way past the end of the game, and that's if your opponent was cheating and you have, like, you know, people who have um, witnesses that saw them cheat. Like, let's say they went out in the hall and used the, their, their phone engine to determine their move, and then they came back, and in a tri time scramble, they made a couple great moves against you because they were cheating, and you lose the game, and then you go to mark the score, and then people come running up to you at the end of the game and say, was that your opponent? We saw him out in the hall with a phone, and he was, he was looking at the, your game, and he was cheating. Well, then the statute of limitations is, is all the way to that, that period. You, you, can't, you can't go to the end of the tournament. You can't go back three weeks later and say, I have a witness. You could do that in terms of getting your opponent into trouble for future tournaments, but it wouldn't save your game. But if he does that and the game is over and you have witnesses that your opponent was cheating, well, yes, then, then you can go to the tournament director with your witnesses and say, I didn't know it at the time. I thought my opponent was going to the bathroom, but I have people here who say he just went out in the hall and looked at his phone and he was analyzing the game and, you know, the tournament director will determine whether or not this is true, if it, and if it is true, even though the game is over, he can reverse the, the uh, results. But, in, but if it's just something like claiming an illegal move or a touch move or setting up the board wrong or all those kind of things, you know, you want to do it right away. If you wait till the game's over and then complain to the tournament director, he's going to say, where were you during the game? Why didn't you get me? I could have done something about it. As a tournament director, I can tell you this happens to me all the time. People are always saying, oh, I didn't know the rule, or I let him do this, or I thought the rule was this. I'll, I'll tell you a story about the two-minute rule. If you're playing a, a sudden death time control and somebody makes an illegal move, then you could get two minutes added to your clock. So one time, one of my students was playing in a sudden death tournament, and I asked how he did, and he said he lost on time. And I said, gee, I thought you had enough time. How did you lose on time? And he said, well, I, may, I was short on time and I made an illegal move and I know there's a two-minute penalty. And my opponent said, that's an illegal move. There's a two-minute penalty. And we both agreed on the penalty. So he took two minutes off my clock and my flag fell. And I said, what? I said, that's not the rule. I said, it's a two-minute penalty. But the two minutes is added to your opponent's clock, not subtracted from your clock. I said, you shouldn't have lost on time. You, you had a good position. If we added two minutes to your opponent's clock, you probably still would have won. But instead, you listen to your opponent, you agree, you heard there was a two-minute penalty, and you both took two minutes off your clock, and then your clock fell, and you agreed that you lost, and then the game's over. So, you know, you should get the tournament director. Don't, don't try to take the law in your own hands. You may hear the story and think, well, that would never happen to me, or that's, that's a rare situation. No, it's not. That kind of thing happens all the time, all the time. People... You know, let their opponents get away with illegal moves. They don't get the tournament director. Here's another example of that. When someone makes an illegal move, it's also touch move. Let's say you check them with a rook, and they don't see it, and they move their queen, and they check you with the queen. And you say, no, no, you're in check. Well, if the queen has a way to get out of check, let's say the queen has to interpose between the rook and the king, then it's touch move. They, It's not only... An illegal move that they moved the queen to check your king because they didn't get out of check themselves but it's touch move and they have to move the queen and that may mean they have to put the queen on prees in between the rook and the king and they would lose the game immediately but a lot of people don't understand that they think it's just the two-minute penalty they take the two-minute penalty and then they let their opponent do anything they want instead of enforcing the fact that it's also touch move and again I see this all the time you know these things that I'm telling you are not like rare things that happen once every blue moon. They happen all the time.
Uh, we already talked about cheating doesn't have the statute of limitation. There's only two ways to resign in the over-the-board game. One is to say, I resign, although you might be able to say it in a different language, but you have to say you resign, or you have to purposely tip over your king. Now, touch move means you have to purposely touch a move. If you reach out to move a bishop, and you accidentally knock over a king on the way to touch your bishop, that's not touch move. You don't have to move your king. I see people, again, getting, getting this wrong all the time, and they say, oh, you have to move your king. Touch move. No, you don't, okay? If when you're resigning, you're, you're grabbing your king on purpose and you're turning it on its side on purpose. You're not reaching out to move your bishop and accidentally knocking over your king. That's not resigning by doing that, okay? So it's purposely turning on your king. Now, what a lot of people do is they don't do either of those things. They stop the clock and they put their hand out to shake hands. Theoretically, that doesn't really resign the game, although almost everybody recognizes that it does. And I actually went to the rules committee and I said, how about if we put in a rule that says if you purposely stop the clock and offer a handshake together, then that's resigning. Because it can't be a draw offer. If you make a draw offer, you have to say, would you like a draw? You can't just stick out your hand because sticking out your hand doesn't mean anything. That could be a resigns, that could be a draw offer, it could be anything, it doesn't have any meaning. But if you say, would you like a draw, that's a draw offer. If you say, I resign, you resign. But people just stop the clock and put out their hand. Well, if you're stopping the clock unilaterally, there's only two reasons you could stop the clock. One is to get the tournament director and the other would be to end the game. Well, the only way you can end the game by yourself is to resign. So if you stop the clock unilaterally and offer your hand, that can't be a draw offer, but the tournament, the rules committee said, no, that's too much of a can of worms. We're going to leave the rule as it is. You have to either say I resign or purposely tip over your king. If you stop the clock and offer your hand and your opponent understands he's resigning and you both mark the score, that's one thing, but we're not going to put it in the rules because that would open up a can of worms. That was the rules that they used. My last rule is the buy. If you don't show up for a round, you get forfeited. But if you show up for a round and you're the odd person, or let's say you get you tell the tournament director I can't make that round, they'll give you a buy. Now a normal buy, if you, if you say to your to the tournament director I can't make the seventh round, I won't be here, he'll give you a half point buy. But if you show up and you want to play and you're the odd person, then you get a full point buy. But you don't have to get a full point buy or a half point buy. You can ask for less if you want to. For instance, suppose you're playing in the under 1800 section and you're only rated 1300 and you're the odd person and they give you a buy, but if you get a full point buy, you're gonna be, be able to play the 1700 players and you really want to play the 1500 players. Well, then what you should tell the tournament director is I'll take the buy, but give me a half point buy or a zero point buy. I don't want a full point buy because I'm not trying to win a prize and I don't want to play the, 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 the stronger players. I'd rather you know, get into the level that I'm looking for, which is more around the, the, the opponents around 1500 and for that, I don't want a full point buy. You almost never see people do that, but it's perfectly legal. You can ask the tournament director for something other than a full point buy if you're there. Now, if you're not showing up at all and you're saying, I can't make the seventh round, then they're pretty much going to give you a half point buy. You can't get a full point buy for that. It's rare you would ask for a zero point buy in that situation, although you can. All right, there's many, many more rules. The rule book is like... Uh, you know, 600 pages. Most of them are for tournament directors on how to pair and all those kind of things. But you don't have to know all the rules. You do need to know that one rule. If anything strange is happening in your game, don't argue with your opponent. Don't discuss it with your opponent. Don't try to figure out the rules. Don't try to try to enforce the rules yourself. Stop the clock at the tournament director. If you don't like what the tournament director says, you can ask him to show you the rule in the rule book. You can even you can even uh, go over his head and say, uh, I would like to appeal your ruling, and he will call a local national director to make your case, that kind of thing. That's beyond the scope of today's video, but uh, know the rules is really important. All right, I hope you enjoyed today's video. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye.